Okay, uh, let me remind you that today is the second day of a 10-day course. So, if you have any doubts, probably in terms of particular, specific parts of modeling, tomorrow we will have Irasema Cavalcanti from IMPE, who is a modeler. She, she knows modeling more than I. So, I mean, if I, I don't know all the answers, but you will have a lot of people working in different areas related to global change that you could talk to them and ask them later on, okay? So, uh, as I mentioned, the idea of this presentation from yesterday and today's blocks is basically to provide some of the basics in terms of climate change observation, some of the issues of climate modeling. You will see more details on models, particularly models, uh, the following days, and then some of the issues of attribution, which probably you will see later on again but perhaps with a different focus on, on uh, I'm providing here. So uh, we're going to talk about attribution with some particular examples, but I think uh, at this stage I would like to sort of summarize with uh, a number of questions on what we have been discussing in terms of climate variability and climate change. Okay? So for instance, the question is, is the climate warming? Okay? You see the answer in there? Yes, temperatures show that about 0 0.8 degrees centigrade since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, perhaps the largest warming has taken place is after the 70s, which you have seen from the previous figures. Uh, there are indicators of natural world, temperatures, and some consequences in, uh, in, in climate, you know, particularly the ones on biodiversity and uh, we show that this is an evidence of worldwide warming. So most of the regions have been experiencing warming, some regions more than others, but it's a general tendency, and they have already impacts of that. So the climate warming, yes, it is. I didn't say anything about causes. It's just the observations show that. Como, uh, how do scientists know that recent climate change is large, largely caused by human, human activities? Uh, some of the results we see before, uh, the ones with the models, remember that we have this sh blue shadow that doesn't reproduce the observed warming, but the combination of natural and anthropogenic, that pink shadow explains well the natural climate variability, the warming in there, and perhaps more strongly since the middle of the 60s or 70s. And there are several methodologies using models of what is called fingerprinting, that you can prove statistically if there are influences of humans or not. Uh, later, in, after the coffee break, I will show you some examples. Actually, some of the results. I'm not going to go into details, so well, it will take forever. But uh, those three documents that shows what I'm going to show later in the afternoon are available on the website of this course. So you can get the documents yourself and start looking on that, because there are very complicated ways to identify if there is a human fingerprint or human signal in any particular extreme, for instance. Okay. Well, the atmosphere, the CO2, is a natural gas. It has been forever and will continue forever. But how can we say that the increase of CO2 it has to do with a significant contribution from human activity. So is warming is increasing, yes, but the human activities are making this increase stronger, okay? Uh, because of basically the use of fossil fuel, it has been increasing at the time, and uh, the use of, uh, of agricultural activities, and others are releasing large amount of methane. So what we know is that CO2 is increasing naturally, but the increase has been even higher because of human activities, and some of the observations show that. But uh, those that don't believe in CO2, they said that, okay, global warming is a consequence of changes in solar activity, which actually will be the first question, the first suspect, because it's uh, uh, energy balance. But uh, the sun, I mean, direct satellites do not show an increase in solar output. Uh, particularly at the same time, the temperatures have been increasing, particularly from the last from the last 30 to 40 years, the middle of the 70s. So no increase in solar activity. So there is no association between 
changes in solar activity and increases in temperature because there has been any significant change in solar activity. Now, in terms of the vertical structure of the atmosphere, in some levels, the lower than atmosphere has been warming, but the upper atmosphere has been cooling. And this is because the satellite, uh, no, sorry, the, the radiosonde data has allowed that for this kind of, of behavior, this kind of analysis. You know? So most of the, I would say that most of the factors explain, particularly those nearby surface, the warming surface. But there is still much unknown in terms of how to explain the cooling in the stratosphere. Okay, if you find papers that shows us a clear answer, please let me know, because as, as far as I remember, there is no good explanation why the atmosphere is cooling. The upper atmosphere is cooling, why the lower atmosphere is, is warming. Well, climate has been changing all of the time. It has changed in the past millions of years in the back, back of time. Why are we worried now? Why do you think we are worried about climate change? It has happened in the past, so what? It will happen again. Well, in terms of impacts of climate change in the past, there have been migration of, of species, extinction of some species, population have been migrating. So the problem now, the, the concern we have of climate change is because we as a human beings are threatened by this. I mean, everyone has their own lifestyle. You don't want to, to move, leave your houses to go somewhere else because the sea level rise is increasing. So basically, the human societies will find very, very difficult to survive without adaptation as a consequence of climate change now. So the way we study climate change is because we as a humans are worried that that may affect us. Okay, like the dinosaurs were extinct, we humans also could be extinct. What's the difference between us and the dinosaurs? I mean, we are species like any other. We have nothing special. So, but in terms that we think about that, we develop science. The climate change is a major concern because it's affecting societies. And when I say societies, also it may be affecting the biodiversity and all the services that biodiversity provides. Is it true that the current level of CO2 it has not any precedent in history. Uh, most of the observations show that compared to reconstructions on paleoclimates. Okay? But remember that the paleoclimate reconstruction is based on bubbles, air present the bubbles, and there are some techniques to measure that. So in terms of uh, indicators, we can say that the levels, current levels of, of CO2 concentration are the highest. Perhaps the highest in the last 50 years or so, but if we compare the reconstruction of millions of years, it's even higher than that. There are some uncertainties, yes, there are. But at least from we, we can see from the evidence of paleoclimate indicators, we have really lower levels as compared to the present. So we have higher activities, human activities, biomass burning, fossil fuel burning. So this is one of the problems that we have. And the impacts are just in temperatures, but changes in rainfall and also in sea level rise. Is there any level in which adding more CO2 will not cause further warming? So, no. Adding more CO2 will cause surface temperature to continue to increase. So if you, let's say, it's not like there is a, a point of no return. I mean, you increase the CO2 temperature will increase. There is no such a thing like a, we reach a level in, well, in which CO2 concentration is stabilized. So that's only on the models, the 2.6 scenario. But in the, idea, in the idea is the CO2 concentrations will increase and the, they will affect the greenhouse gas, the greenhouse uh, effect, they will enhance the greenhouse effect, uh, affect the energy budget, and also temperatures will continue to increase. As I mentioned before on the first slides, the decades are different. For instance, does the rate of warming vary from a decade to another? Yes. You see, the last two decades, for instance, are a bit warmer, much warmer than the 60s and 70s. Okay? And most of these variations are related to uh, natural climate variability. 
but uh, the long warming trend is related to human induced. It's like a, you have a background signal. The background signal is warming. So in 1960, imagine a 0.5 degrees anomaly in 1960 and a 0.5 degrees anomaly in 2015. Which one will have more impact? The one in the 60 or the one in the 2015? It's the same anomaly, but the mean has been changing, meaning that the stationarity of the series has been changing. Okay, that's the reason why, for instance, in 2005, we have a very strong hurricane activity in the North Atlantic. It was 0 0.5 degrees warmer, 0 0.7, actually, degrees warmer. But in the past, there were anomalies even higher, but the problem is the mean was lower in the past as compared now. So you have the absolute values, you will see a difference. But the warming was even the same magnitude, but the reference period, the Vanguard out, was different. Okay, that's the reason why you have decades and other. That's the reason it slowed down. This is what is called the hiatus. Uh, remember I mentioned yesterday that uh, after 1997-98 uh, El Niño, there was a tendency for stabilizing even lower, and then it started to increase. At the time, like I said, the recent slowdown that happened between 1998 and 2010 is the climate change is no longer happening. No, it's not a signal. It's just part of natural climate variability. So the, the uh, warming is still there. Now, if the world is warming, why are some winters and summers still very cold? It has happened. In, uh, you see even in the newspapers uh, some pictures of snow storm in New York and the headlines, you know, where is global warming gone? Well, the problem with that is that extremes are changing. Okay? Global warming is a longer time trend. It's a longer time trend, but there is a lot of variability. Meaning that the variability means, for instance, uh, cold winters, warm summers, some cold days during summer, some warm days during winter. It has been changing, and year to year it has been changing. So, for instance, the examples we have in the northern hemisphere, where we have extremely cold days with the snow storms that affect large parts of the United States. And then, during summer, we have extreme large temperatures, heat waves in Europe, for instance, and in India and in Japan. So, uh, I can say that the world, as a consequence of the warming, the extreme the weather extremes are becoming more extremes, okay? Variability, basically. Sometimes, uh, in year-to-year -year data, sometimes the Antarctic ice increases and sometimes decreases, which is different from the Arctic. But uh, why is that? I mean, it's this consequence that perhaps the northern hemisphere is warming and the southern hemisphere is cooling. I mean, we can you have to believe that changes in ice are related to winds and changes in circulation, ocean currents, currents okay? So um, it seems like changes in wind and in the ocean seems to be dominating the patterns of climate change and sea ice in, around Antarctica. I, as I mentioned before, we don't have that much, that many stations in Antarctica. So in terms of uncertainty, it's still a lot of uncertainty what could happen in the Antarctica. But it, it's clear that some years are really a lot of snow and others less, but the tendency is going down. Okay? You may have a lot of snow in one year, less than another, but it's the tendency is going down. Again, variability is changing a lot. How does climate change affect the strength and frequency of floods, droughts, hurricanes, and tornadoes? Basically, the extremes. Heat waves are generally becoming more frequent. Trends in extreme rainfall vary from region to region. The most pronounced changes are evident in North America and parts of Europe, particularly in winter. And when you have warming, this, according to, to physical laws, when you have warming, this energy has to dissipate. And what is one way to release energy is through storms or hurricanes or tornadoes. So if you think that we will be very happy we don't have to, uh, hurricanes. You are wrong, because hurricanes in one, is one way to reduce 
energy, to release energy. And we need them, otherwise our planet will explode. We don't follow the energy conservation. Okay? And that since the temperatures are increasing, we need more energy and that energy has to dissipate more. It's like in earthquakes. For instance, I'm not sure if somebody's working with earthquakes or somebody has experienced an earthquake. But sometimes it's better to have regular earthquakes, category three, four, in the richer scale, that 100 years without one, and then suddenly we have a seven or eight degrees one. It's extremely stronger. It's the same thing with, with, uh, with um, hurricanes, for instance. In the future, we may have the number of hurricanes may be lower, but the number of strong hurricanes, hurricanes will be higher because we will have more energy to release, particularly if the oceans are getting warmer. How fast is sea level rising? Well, the data shows that sea level is rising in many places. The best estimates is 3.2 millimeters per year. The overall rise is uh, 901, is about 20 centimeters. But in terms of fast, according to some of the time series we saw, the satellite data has been showing that the elevation of the sea level has been faster in the last 20 years or so as compared in the past. But again, the past is limited because we don't have that much data. So in terms of uncertainty, fact, this is true, but there is a lot of uncertainty with, because we don't have a, a strong history of sea level rise in many regions of the planet. We have in North America and Europe, but we don't have that much, for instance, in South America or Southern Africa. Australia, I don't know, but maybe it's the same situation. The ocean acidification. Now, they show, for instance, uh, uh, chemical balance of seawater have shifted to more acidic, which is mean lower pH. Uh, biodiversity systems have been affected. Um, it's more difficult for the uh, animals uh, to keep their shells because of, you remember, the shells are calcium and most of them are more basic, basic means a higher pH. But this is related to temperature, increase, temperature increase. And that creates uh, chemical reactions. But it has been going faster in some places. If you read the newspapers, it shows a lot in, in the corals in Australia, for instance, in the West Pacific. How confident are scientists that Earth will warm further over the coming century? Very confident. The evidence shows very likely. It's a vicious continue in their present trajectory without the uh, technology or regulatory abatement, the warming will go from 2.6 to 0.8. This is without any mitigation. Okay? If we have mitigation, if we have, for instance, a global reforestation program or a global system for capturing CO2, that's what may have, uh, particularly by the end of the century, this century. Climate change. Changes of a few degrees are a cause of concern. If, if the planet warms two degrees, for instance, well, two degrees, it doesn't look that much. I mean, from day to night here today, it changes more than two degrees. But two degrees is the average from everywhere. You may have places with eight degrees warming. We may have places with 0 0.2 degrees warming. But then globally, it's two degrees. So. Um, during the last ice age, was only about to four to five, seven degrees colder than now. Global warming of just a few degrees will be associated with changes in anything we have in terms of biodiversity, human population. And they will have extreme impacts in population, particularly the extremes related to these changes. As I mentioned here in this report from the World Bank, a warmer planet, four degrees warmer, actually will mean basically another planet, different from the one we know. And adaptation is no longer an option. So we will be probably extinct like the dinosaurs. What are scientists doing about this? What you guys are doing about this? <laughs> Don't tell me you are recycling garbage, because that's political statement. But in terms of what to do is understand how the system works. See, science is continual process of observation, understanding, modeling, testing, and prediction. So it's a lot of work. You have a theory, you have to test the model. If the model doesn't work, you have to retest the model, undeveloped model. So it's a long, long, long 
process. ¿sí? The prediction of a long-term in global warming from increasing greenhouse is robust and has been confirmed by growing body of, of evidence. ¿sí? And there are some fields that need to be uh, explained, like for instance, some of the climate dynamics, cloud dynamics, and also the variations in decadal time scale at regional level. Okay, those are research areas that need a lot of work. Okay, for instance, if somebody says, okay, let's go to Southern Africa. Southern Africa, what could happen with the uh, extremes in Southern Africa? We don't have much data over there, observation. So what can we expect in the future? The model doesn't reproduce well, let's say, the few temperature or, or, or uh, rainfall records. So that means that there is a lot of work to do because we have to understand how the climate in Southern Africa works. So it means like if you are going to do a climate study in one region, you have to understand how the climate works. And sometimes the physical system now is not the same physical that it was two million years ago or will be not the same system that will be in the next 100 or 200 years. Okay? The evidences sort of change, show the changes, and you have to explain in dynamical terms if those changes are really happening or it's just coincidence that the uh, temperature record was, uh, let's say, uh, the thermometer was broken and there was a temperature, faulty temperature, and you try to explain this cooling over there with all the physics and dynamics you can, but in reality, it was just a broken thermometer. So you're wasting your time. Okay, so that happened. That's the reason why you have to have a lot of confidence in the data you use. But first, you have to check the quality of the data. If the data is full of errors, or uh, it, you didn't know that the station changes places, but they kept the name, you have to be aware of that before doing any understanding. So when you understand how the climate works in one place, what are the causes of these climate variations in the present, you may be able to pinpoint well what happened in the future. And even better if you know how it was in the past. Okay? Like I said, it's like the doctor. You want to treat a patient, you have to know the climate history. If you don't know the climate history of a new patient, you have to redo plenty of exams which means you have to understand how the system, how the health of this patient is. Some of these issues, like for instance, the uh, turning off of the Gulf Stream, the release of methane from the Arctic, or from, this, uh, from Siberia, the Arctic actually, the tipping point of the savanization of the Amazon regions. Do we have to be worried about that? If you remember again the day after tomorrow, the film, why New York was flooded and frozen and why all the Americans were running away to Mexico? Huh? The exactly, the thermal in current, what is called the uh, turning off of the Gulf Stream. So the tropics are a source of energy for the regions outside the tropics. So all this energy accumulated in the tropics is transported to the north, particularly in the Atlantic, through the thermohaline circulation. Thermo, temperature haline, salty. But what happens if uh, you have the melting or Antarctica, of the Arctic, sorry, the uh, Greenland? You have much fresh water into the ocean. You have less salt in there. So the haline circulation it changes because you don't have a gradient of salt anymore. So it's like you suddenly cut the flux of energy. So what happened? The north gets cooler, the southern part gets warmer, and then you see the beginning of a new ice age. This is the major concern. It is a concern. The problem is we don't know that much. This is one of the major uncertainties. Those are what are called the tipping points. Tipping point is like you go there, it's a tipping point, and then go to another equilibrium system, another climate. Basically, no return, point of no return. Tipping point is a point of no return. Okay? These are results from the base available climate models do not predict abrupt, abrupt changes in such systems. Like, for instance, the one of the savanization in the Amazon. Only one model reproduces that or shows that. The others don't. It may happen. It may happen. It's likely 
Probably not, but it may happen. It's a one possible scenario for the future. However, if warming increases, the possibility of these major abrupt changes cannot be ruled out. In the case of the Amazon, if concentration of CO2 reaches 400 parts per million and temperature goes above 4.5 above 4 degrees centigrade, we may reach the tipping point in which the Amazon is no longer a sink of carbon, but is a source of carbon, meaning that we change from a tropical rainforest to savanna type. And you can imagine, it will change everything global, globally. But again, the uncertainties are low, because it's shown by one model. The forests are resilient at, at one particular limit. But if warming keeps going and going above 4 degrees centigrade on some, these events that are really low probability, they can occur. They are low probability by high impact. Okay? So, is it possible that they happen? It is. Will they happen? We don't know. Okay? We don't know. It may happen, yes. It may happen tomorrow, but we don't know. Of course, in that movie, it was one day to another. I mean, if this happened with the hermaline circulation, it's a process that takes hundreds of thousands of years, not just one day or two days. If emissions of greenhouse gases were stopped, would the climate return okay. to the conditions of 200 years ago? What do you think? No. What I explained before is the inertia. You see? No, even if emissions of greenhouse gases were suddenly stopped, Earth will continue warming. Will not cool to the pre industrial level. What will temperature will be basically will be stabilized. Not cooling, will be stabilized. Okay? It's like the same thing, for instance, they say, okay, I'm going to start a diet. Uh, I'm going to eat only lettuce today. Does it mean that tomorrow I will be thinner? No. Because there is so much fat accumulated that you have to lose it somehow. You see, maybe it's a long process that you get thinner and thinner. No? Lucky for the thinner. Right? But uh, in, it's the same situation. It's the inertia. The CO2 is there, and we have to deal with that. We have to take that out. And any cooling is very unlikely. But at least what we like to see is that the warming reaches a level that it doesn't affect that much. And that was within 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. And I'm not sure if you can see this figure, but I took it from IPCC. It basically shows the possible impacts from uh, in health, glaciers, sea, water, forest, and biodiversity, food, and health, from a 1.1 1 .1 degree warming, 1.5, 2, 3, 4, and 5 degrees. Just choose one. This is more for the Caribbean, Central, and South America. Let's say heat and drought. You see, we may have, for instance, uh, an area affected by, initial, by heat waves. Could be 65% of the region, uh, Central and South America, affected by heat waves if we have a 3 degrees warming. For 90%, if we have 4 degrees warming. The same thing with the biomass burning in the Amazon. So basically, the impacts are higher and higher if you get a warming before or above some particular level, particularly two degrees. So this is basically uh, produced using a combination of different studies and data sets. It's not perfect, no. It's like an X-ray of the situation. But there are still some things that you cannot explain. For instance, with the glacier. In some places, the glacier will disappear, or almost 70% will disappear if we have a 4 degrees warming. With the sea level rise, same situation, same in water. If you go higher and higher and higher, with 2 degrees centigrade, we may have a, a river discharge decreases in northeast Brazil, like the San Francisco River, and then increases in biomass and carbon losses in the Amazon, and we are going higher and higher. So really, the warm you get, the most traveling will be the situation. Okay. I'm not sure if any of you have experiences with this kind of impacts, but um, is there any question on this or any comment or some particular study in your regions that you may be able to share with us? So going back to thermohaline circulation, um, I think it's an interesting example to bring up, and it's one that is fairly catastrophic that's brought up, right? But the last time that happened, 
It was a, a collapse of the Laurentide ice sheet, which covered large portions of Canada. Um, and, and it did have a really marked impact. It decreased global temperature by three to six degrees Celsius, but only for a short period of time, right? Um, and I'm trying to think of any sort of natural, even climate-induced event that would release billions of cubic meters of um, fresh water into the North Atlantic. Like, I definitely understand that we can have catastrophic events happen, yes. but I think that it's important that we realize that even though climate change is happening quickly, it's not happening on the scale of like weeks, like the collapse of the Laurentide ice sheet. And so it's, I, I just think it's an interesting thing. I just, I'm interested in your opinion on it because I think that the public wants us to say like, oh, this catastrophic thing could happen. But as scientists, we look at the Earth system and it still has a lot of inertia in it. Even if Greenland were to melt, it's not going to melt in a few weeks' time. And yes. so I wouldn't expect that thermohaline circulation would be affected. Yes, yeah, all of these processes are slow. They don't happen one day to another. They happen in thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. It's the same situation, for instance, imagine this, the uh, Greenland, which is basically a junk piece of ice over the rock. To get that melting, it's not like you melt an ice cube in Caminos. It basically breaks and then it starts falling in pieces, and it's something that will not happen one day or two days. The only catastrophic event could change the climate in weeks if we have an impact of a meteor, because you will see immediate reaction. Or if all volcanoes erupt at the same time, we may see some months or years or decades, which in geological terms are really very fast. But the thermohaline circulation will not change from one day to another. No, these are the kind of abrupt events. But if we have some external forcing, for instance, like the meteor, that may change. It's, it's is it possible? It is. <laughs> it is probably low probability. But if it happens, it will have a very high impact. Okay? It's like this, also the, the, the species. I mean, it's, it's hard to see. I'm not sure if perhaps you know more than this, but some countries, they have this monitoring system of species. So you can see, for instance, when some particular species disappear or not. It's not from one year to another. Usually it's a long, long process, but there's something going on. I'm not sure, for instance, does anyone have some experience with uh, biodiversity and sea level rise in their countries? Is there any observed impact on freshwater ecosystems affected by uh, sea level rise? No question? Oh, come on. I guess the most regarding the, the the speed of change of this tipping point, I think the the, the, um, the most scary thing is that th there are many non-linearities. Yes. So in a way, uh, we can't simply we can't use the past to to infer the future anymore, and I think that's that's a key point that different that is important to keep in mind when something starts to happen, we don't know what else will happen or to what the speed. Yeah, when, when I said the past is a, a good example, if you want to understand how the climate will change, you have to understand how the climate system works now. And sometimes the past reconstructions, they show how the system worked in the past. But it doesn't mean that the system functioning now is the exact functioning in the past. You see? No way. For instance, you want to explain the South Pacific Convergence Zone and the South Atlantic Convergence Zone. In the present, we know where they are. In the future, this sort of intensified or weak, in the, in depending on the model. But if you go back, for instance, two million years in the past, you see, OK, well, uh, my samples show that the South Pacific Convergence Zone was weaker or stronger. How do you know that there was South Pacific Convergence Zone at the time? See, even if we have the tilting of the earth, I mean, it's like the, the circulation systems change. So if we know that the climate in the past has evolved, the climate in the present is different, we sort of have an idea how the system works. It doesn't mean that the climate of the present is exactly the same as the climate of the past. 
or the future. But we want to learn how the system evolves. We know how the system climate, climate system works in the past, for instance. Maybe totally different from the present. But at least we know how the system changed. So it means that the climate system has been changing once in a while. And this is the kind of things we would like to see. You see? So the future helps to understand the present. And the past helps to see how the present climate has evolved or changed. Okay? Remember that our modern era is a small piece of time compared to the long geological eras. Okay? Any other question or comment on based on his comments? Um, this is on looking forward. Sorry. So um, so my question is on the tipping points. Um, for example, uh, Greenland methane gas being re released and, and also methane released from the oceans. Yeah. Um, is there a point which the models indicate this is going to happen more than likely once we reach four degrees or, or more? Is there a, a point where the models will indicate, okay, that's inevitability or that's going to happen at four degrees or five degrees or with a certain concentration of, of CO2? Well, it's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say because it, this is something that you usually prove with models. You see, the model can tell, for instance, 400 parts per million and 3.5 or 4.5 degrees warming in the Amazon. That's something that the model shows. And in some cases in the Amazon, if the deforestation goes beyond 40%, for instance, you may see a tipping point in there, but it's basically modeling results. You see? In the physical terms, you may explain the changes in, in the carbon cycle. But to see, actually, about what value you may have problems, it's really uh, difficult. That's the reason why the different studies derived from IPCC shows that there is some sort of consensus that uh, what is called the dangerous climate change, which is means beyond four degrees, may be really affecting everything, everyone. But that doesn't mean with the four degree centuries you will have the tipping point. It may happen before and even after, but four degrees is the one that measures impacts. And you don't have to reach the tipping point to see impacts. When you go to the tipping point means like no way back. There is no return. I mean, just basically everything is changing. Okay? But the idea is not to reach the tipping point. That's why mitigation comes handy. Any other question? You're very quiet. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, can you talk uh, a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the changes in the, in the ozone layer? Because uh, it was shown that it was a recovery recently, but it seems like if uh, the ozone layer were no, was no longer a concern. It is always a concern because of, uh, like any other things, there is a lot of variability from year to another. Okay, I mean, the history of the ozone hole was with these satellite tops, I think, that people thought that satellite there has a problem. They thought there was a faulty uh, functioning of the, of the satellite when it starts showing this dark region. It actually means like uh, the thinning of the uh, ozone hole. It means not a hole. It's basically the thinning of the ozone layer. Uh, there have been some years which actually has been recovering a smaller area and others which have been increasing. And as far as I can see from the different projections, there is no indication that climate change is affecting that. The problem is with the CFCs, which has been banned from the proto uh, Montreal Protocol in 1996, I think. So the United States and Europe, they no longer produce refrigerators using this freon gas. But they export those to Africa and poor countries. So they are still working in there. You see, you see the, 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 tip, the time series of, of um, CFCs, they are going up and they are going down, but they didn't reach zero. So it, it's not, as far as I know, it's not related to climate change. It's more like interannual. Okay? You may see years with the recovery like now, but we can see the recovery a few years ago. And then, again, it's getting bigger. But it's not the whole. It's basically the thinning of the 
of the uh, uh, ozone. Okay? If you remember those Japanese movies, no, where the Concorde explodes in the stratosphere and then you see a hole in there and all the Japanese burning because the ultraviolet cell coming and people boiling in there. Uh, it was an exercise of sort of uh, like the day after tomorrow to give you an example of the war situation if we do nothing. Okay? Sometimes it's good to watch TV because you learn the stupid things that are going on, but <laughs> in a very, very nice way, you know. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a comment. Uh, if you co to compare to with the risk uh, index, is the same a scenario when you say, uh, for example, uh, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras, we have a top uh, top uh, top ten to. Uh, risk for the uh, development country with uh, India, Nepal, and um, I can't remember the other. Uh, two, two second example is uh, we lost Mayan bi biosphere. Uh, two months ago, we, we have a burned f a forest, uh, drugs, and other uh, disaster, na a natural disaster. Yeah, uh, I think in a few days you are going to have the presence of Edwin Castellanos from Guatemala. He's going to talk about the impacts. But as far as I remember, as a, one of the consequences of the report, Central America is one of the most, most vulnerable uh, regions affected for climate variability and change. I mean, as you mentioned, I think from what I understood was the fires in there, the hurricanes in there, it takes like a... I think it was Andrew that killed 10,000 people in Honduras because the Honduras people were not prepared for this kind of natural disaster. So if you, ter if you think in terms of extremes, perhaps the most important extreme would be a landslide or a flood, flash flood that killed people. How, how is that related? Is that related to extremes in rainfall? So as I mentioned, yes, there is a combination of higher extreme and also higher vulnerability of population. I'm not sure if that's what you asked me. I couldn't hear that well at the first question. Oh, okay, okay. No, it, it, you're right. I mean, in some countries, they're already feeling the effects of, of, uh, of extremes. But in the line of work I do now, because I used to work with weather forecast, climate forecast, climate change, and work now with natural disaster from climatic origin, we have seen that the natural disaster has been increasing in time together with extremes. But plus the extremes, we have the population is getting more vulnerable this time. So they are building in places that they shouldn't be. They are living in very dangerous regions, and they don't want to leave because they don't have any option. Uh, in some of the experiences we have in Brazil, uh, my center was created in 2011 after a landslide that killed almost 1,000 people in Rio de Janeiro. And at the time, the president says, well, it's not tolerated that country with doctors in meteorology and supercomputer don't issue this forecast of natural disasters. So a new center was created for natural disasters. It was sort of taking by force to one place to, to, to another. But that's because the, the impacts are increasing, OK? And usually, if you see this one, which actually probably is more relevant to other, to other uh, talks, but I'm going to show it anyway, because I'm the first one can show things that we will probably will see again. But uh, no, we have been discussing this: climate, natural variability, or anthropogenic climate change. This is the things we have been working yesterday and today, and probably will work most of the week. But there is another aspect, the socioeconomic processes, socioeconomic pathways, adaptation and mitigations, actions and governance. All of this together with the physical forcing, there is an interaction between vulnerability, hazards, and exposure. And then we have in common the risk. You see? So we want to reduce the risk. Disaster risk reduction, for instance, is what the protocol of Sendai the Sendai framework is working on it. You know about the earthquake several years ago, actually a few years ago, in Japan, 
with the tsunami in the Sendai city. So the name of Sendai was adopted because that was perhaps the best example of a natural disaster. And the consequences they have with Fukushima and thousands of people dead as a consequence of that. So we have been working on this. This is the part of the equation we developed yesterday and today. But just see that this part of the equation is part of the bigger concern, which is the socioeconomical problems, the combination of climate and socioeconomical brings the issue of hazards, vulnerability, and exposure of populations. Risk, basically. So if somebody says, well, what am I studying climate change? In my case, for instance, for my center, to quantify and reduce risk. See? We work all together, but that's the idea of that. Uh, oh, it worked. I usually don't like animations, but uh, my student did that, so I'm going to use it just to make him happy. Uh, when we have the risks, we have the impacts. Okay? And these impacts could affect population, governance, and in terms of impact, it could affect climate variability again. For instance, you have the increase of uh, droughts, the increase of fire, the increase of greenhouse gases. Climate variability is stronger, climate change is even higher because you have more release of greenhouse gases. And also, land use changes. The emission of land use change, deforestation, urbanization will affect the anthropogenic climate change. Okay, so everything is connected. So in terms to deal with anthropogenic climate change is to cut the force of that, which is basically the CO2 and methane gases. We have also uh, water vapor, but in terms of, of, uh, of greenhouse gases, the ones more related to human activities are CO2 and methane. We want to mitigate that, meaning redu reduction of the greenhouse gases emissions. Vulnerability and exposure. We want to reduce exposure. We want to reduce vulnerability of population. So we want to address multidimensional inequalities, uh, low regret strategies. For instance, inequalities. It's, as I mentioned yesterday, I think it was the issue of gender and climate change. Okay? The women are the most vulnerable to climate change. At least there are several studies that show that. Okay? And then we have to reduce that. How to reduce that? It's more on this side. Because when you, when you want to reduce vulnerability and exposure, it basically has to do with socioeconomic and governance. Okay? Risk. Risk is something that is always there. If you go outside and eat a banana, somebody leaves the pill, and you can show, fall down, there is a risk you fall down. If there is a risk that your bus will crash today. So I'm not taking that bus and going another car. But we have to assess the risk. Risk is something there. It's like the uncertainty. We cannot get rid of us uncertainty. You have to assess the risk. How to manage the risk and increase the perception of risk. I, I mentioned, I think somebody asked yesterday about the perception of the population on climate change. And in terms of, of sea level rise and, and waves, for instance, in the last 20 years, uh, the newspaper shows that People is more concerned about that than in the 60s or the 50s. So there is a perception that these things are happening now. Perhaps they don't know the science behind it, but there is a perception of this. And we have to get a perception of the risk. So basically, we have to recognize that the risk exists. We have to assess the risk. And we have to work with technologies to measure that risk and minimize it. For instance, one of the ways we do uh, my center is the monitoring of the risk. Before issue, for instance, um, forecast of landslide or, uh, um, let's say, it, or uh, flash floods, we have all the system of monitoring. We are monitoring conditions, not just rainfall, but the system itself. You see? So risk is something that you have to reduce, but to reduce it, you have to know it. You have to assess it. You have first to admit this one. Perception of risk, okay? Socioeconomic pathways. Usually all transformation and development is related to fossil 
that's development. Unfortunately, uh, the development in terms of uh, uh, clean energy is still very, very slow. So we have diverse values and objectives. We have climate resilient pathways, and we have transformation. There are several ways to, to focus on this, to try to make this more adjustable, make this more, let's say, climate friendly. Because this will depend on that, the climate forcing, but actually even the paper has more from the governance. And socioeconomical pathways is basically development mechanisms and processes. Adaptation and interaction with mitigation. Uh, adaptation is, you will see a, a some lessons, some, some questions, some uh, presentation on adaptation. But adaptation is basically specific. For instance, you want to adapt to sea level rise in, uh, let's say, the city of Recife in northeast Brazil, which is a coastal city, a very touristic a large city in Northeast Brazil, one of the most important, perhaps the most important in Northeast Brazil. But could happen. You want to assess the sea level rise risk. Uh, let's say somebody from New York says, okay, we use this model. We are going to use the same model in, that we use in, from New York in Recife. It doesn't work. It's not one size fits all. Adaptation is something you have to, to develop in terms of context, specific. Okay, that's the reason why adaptation is kind of complicated, because there is no a recipe. Brazil has released recently our Plano Nacional de Adaptación, National Adaptation Strategy. You will read in there, you will see perhaps half is more like uh, impacts and the other half sort of measures, but still they don't have the details. That's just the first document. I mean, of course, it has to be very general, but if somebody says, okay, well, I want to do, see, for instance, we have the crab population in, uh, in some coastal region in the state of Pará. How this adaptation will work to protect this species? It's not something that you will do from one day to another. It's something that you have to do. It's a, small, it's a long process. Same thing in Santos. In Santos, we didn't study that with the sea level rise for the 2100, we may be losing about... Uh, 1.2 billion dollars, uh, considering the damages to the physical uh, infrastructure, the port and the luxurious apartments in there. But if adaptation is implemented, this will be reduced to 300 US million dollars, almost three times lower. We're going to lose money, yes, but don't want to lose that much. Okay, and there are some co benefits of this. With adaptation, for instance, what is called now the ecosystem-based adaptation, adaptation based in ecosystems, which sometimes is much better than the physical infrastructure. You can say, okay, I'm going to, the, uh, to buy, to build a wall. But this wall will protect me against floods, coastal floods, I mean invasion of the ocean, but it will leave my property ugly. It doesn't look good to have a wall covering the whole beautiful entrance of my luxurious apartment. So people don't like to do that because they are affecting the aesthetic value of their property. And at the end, when we have a, a strong wind, sometimes the waves reach the buildings and they go down there. That's the reason why now they are sort of palafits now. I mean, people is, is building the parking spaces higher, you see, and just leaving columns in there. So it's, it's adaptation. It's one way of adaptation. But at least it gives you a possibility of protecting yourself and your properties, okay? And governance. Governance is perhaps the most important because whatever political decision on adaptation will have to come from the government, okay? Adaptation is a national strategy. It's a, a, a usually the government that provides that together with the science community, okay? Decision making under uncertainties, yes, there is always uncertainty in any projection, but you have to do something about that. Learning, monitoring, and having flexibility. Flexibility means that you have to convince the decision makers that this is good to do these kind of things, even though it may be costly or it may take longer than expected. So the mayor will start doing now, but the credit will be for the next mayor because adaptation takes years. Okay? And also coordination across scales. 
In countries like Brazil, you have the city, you have the state, you have the federal government. There has to be a great coordination between city, state, and federal governments. In other countries, perhaps it's different, but sometimes there are several problems in the coordination between a state and federal government. I work for the federal government, for instance. You see, but sometimes it's very difficult to interact with the states, and population is held hostage in the middle of this discussion. So, while climate changes, these discussions keep going and going and going. So lack of governance may increase the risk, may increase the vulnerability and exposure of population to hazards. Okay. Well, um, there is a, a large insurance company called Munich Re from Germany. And it's interesting because every year this show this, produce this kind of summary of lost events worldwide, basically rel related to geophysical events like earthquakes, tsunami, and volcanic activity, meteorological events like tropical storms, extratropical storms, convective storms, hydrological events like flood and mass movement, and climatological extremes like droughts, wildfire. So you see, each dot represents a natural disaster, costly natural disaster. And they are everywhere. Nobody is, 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 is uh, let's say, is immune to this. In some places, it's much than other. For instance, uh, this is from 2014. The drought in Brazil in 2014, the hurricane Odil, severe storms in the U.S., floods in the United Kingdom, earthquake in China, and, and others, several of them, all of them according to country. Some of them, there is not much to do, like earthquakes, for instance, and volcanic eruptions. But in others, they are very costly. The uh, cost of the drought in Sao Paulo for 2014, according to Munich Ray, was about five US billion dollars. Okay, extremely costly. Sao Paulo is a rich state, so when we have our agricultural and transportation and all of this affected by one extreme phenomenon like drought, like lack of rain, it creates an impact or a natural disaster, which we call it drought, for instance. Okay? And that's everywhere. And the, for 2016, same situation. But the drought in Bolivia, the worst in 25 years, the floods in, somewhere in Colombia. So the natural disasters are, are everywhere. And it, this is basically with extremes changing, produce natural disasters from hydrometeorological origin, okay? Leave out the earthquakes or tsunamis or things like that, but if we have a climate change, this will be more frequent and the insurance companies will lose a lot of money. So you can think in terms of climate change also as insurance. What they say, one way of adaptation is insurance. So if you lose your property, you may be able to rebuild yourself with the money from the insurance. Okay, it's, it's just an option. If you don't insure your property, if you have, a, let's say, a wave that destroys your house, I mean, there is not much you can do. You lost everything. If you are going to lose everything, but at least have the money to restart rebuilding somewhere else. This is a, one way of adaptation. Okay? Just to give you an example. And the number of natural disasters has been increasing in time. Okay? Climatological events in orange, Meteorological events in green and hydrological events in blue. So we have more extremes that have related to more natural disasters. It has been increasing a lot since the last, this is from 1982 to 2015. But what does it mean? Does it mean that the meteorological events are getting more extreme or that more population is each time more vulnerable to this kind of extremes? Or a combination of both? Actually, the, the answer is a combination of both. Okay, so if you study climate change, but you also study impacts, you will see that the climate is the forcing from the natural side, the governance is the force, the governance is the forcing from the human side, and they have to work together to make the uh, impact of the natural disaster related to a meteorological extreme lower. If they don't, you will see the cost of this situation going higher and higher and higher. Okay, uh, it's, I mean, you can 
download this from the Munich Re uh, website. Uh, you can get it for free, basically. I like this kind of, uh, this is the, what the Pope says. And just to finish this part before going to um, the attribution. This is one way to explain what I showed before, the risk. With the hazards, like a heat wave, coastal storms. The vulnerability, size and density, topography, percent of, of poor people, percentage of gross domestic product. The adaptive capacity, information and resources, institutional institutions and governance, and change agents, including funding in there. All of them interact and they intersect working on the risk. So for instance, if you want to say, okay, the risk of uh, having more population affected as a consequence of increasing heat waves. Heat waves is the hazard. Vulnerability means that the population increase, particularly the poor increase. And if no, there is no adaptive capacity. So there is no adaptation strategy. You may have your risk increase. Okay, so uh, depending on what's your field of expertise or the work you are doing, you can include yourself in one of those three circles. But the intersection of those three circles is common, is the risk. Okay? Climate change may increase the risk of natural disasters from hydrometeorological origin. Perhaps not tsunamis, not earthquakes, but from hydrometeorological origin. And this is even worse if we have urban centers. Okay, this may be even worse when you talk about cities. Okay, because if you have to rural area, perhaps not as much. Or you may start thinking in terms, for instance, of drought. Droughts may affect the vulnerability of, for instance, in this case, you have agricultural production and types of crops. And in here, the adaptive capacity. We don't have varieties which are resistant to drought conditions. So we have the risk of impacts in agriculture very high. So what is the famous uh, water, energy, and food production, water, energy, and food insecurity? Okay, the insecurity. Those are the impacts that affect population. So you can say, for instance, climate change will affect people. Mm. How? Through water, energy, and food losses or insecurity. Okay. Any question on this? Somebody has an experience of this? Don't be shy. Yes. According to your presentation, how can I uh, link with SDG and Hyogo? Hyogo? Yeah, Hyogo, uh, Sendai is the evolution of Hyogo. Means that the uh, uh, the Hyogo protocol is basically the natural disasters, which means that understanding, monitoring, and what they call building it back better, meaning recovery. You see, and the uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, I have read that document. It's kind of well, it's a large document. I cannot say that much about this, but some of the efforts we do is in terms of. Uh, Increasing the resilience popula population, resilience of the population. So what I can say is that in the current world, we work together with the Hyogo Protocol to sustainable development goals, the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Combat to the Desertification, and uh, biodiversity. So all of these programs, international programs, are dealing basically to see how to reduce this. All of them are related to this. If you reduce risk, you are, let's say, filling some of the uh, sustainable development goals. You are going together with the Sendai framework that shows that you have to understand and reduce the mortality of these processes. And in terms of climate change also, because you are quantifying the climate change. You are reducing the risk of drought, for instance, if there is a problem with drought in one situation. So I can say that all of these uh, programs, they converge in one, is the risk. We want to reduce risk. We, don't, we cannot get rid of a risk. Risk is like uncertainty in the model. You cannot get rid of uncertainty. You have to quantify. In this case, 
you cannot get rid of risk. We have to quantify, we have to assess, we have to monitor, and we have to predict it. Okay? Particularly, prediction is nice because if you are going to predict, a, let's say, a landslide for tonight, usually the landslides, they like to, they love to be at night or even early morning. But we have to do this kind of things. Okay? So it's, it's a context, an international context, basically focus on these three circles. Okay? Any other question or comment? Yes? Thank you. <laughs> you said that uh, uh, lack of governance increases the risk of climate change. You know, and I can say about my country, Bangladesh, it is one of the most vulnerable country in the world due to climate change, and we don't have good governance. And we have history of that. We don't have good governance till now. And so how effective adaptation process is possible in our country, like other developing country? Well, it's a, it's a good question. But uh, I always thought that Bangladesh has this institute by Professor Salim Hook, which is for, for uh, Plot. But in any case, adaptation is an action that has to do with uh, governance, with planning. And if there is lack of governance, it will be a total chaos. For instance, I'll give you an example. The drought in Northeast Brazil is an example. What happened? At the beginning of the drought, the government started releasing uh, what we call food baskets, I mean food for people. But later on, they realized that for seven year drought, it was too much food baskets. So what, this is what we call, uh, what I call maladaptation. Because adaptation is something that it takes longer and solves one situation definitely. It's not like instant. There is no such a thing as instant adaptation. And when the drought is over, for instance, goes back to normal. Adaptation is disappeared. No. So the issues of governance is something that has been discussed everywhere. Like in Brazil, we have a national plan of adaptation, a national plan of climate change. But even with that, governance is a bit complicated. You see? Because of also we have this sort of a lack of consistency between the state and federal government for, uh, regulations. You see? Means lack of consistency doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's basically sometimes... Uh, the government says one thing, the priority of the government is one, but the priority of the state may be other, which is common in, in federations. Okay, so it, it depends. I mean, it has to be very, very decision-making process. Adaptation is a decision-making process. The science provides of the understanding of climate change. It should provide the decision-makers of scientific evidence to prove that there is a, a need for adaptation because the extremes are getting more extreme, that the droughts are getting more frequent, that the population is most exposed now than before. So that should be enough for people to start thinking in terms of adaptation. But sometimes it doesn't work because the government may think that there is a priority, you know, like uh, get the economy better for the next two years while adaptation may take longer. You see? So it's priorities. Unfortunately, some of the priorities, climate change issues, come to middle to low priority. In some countries, in others not, but most of them. Any other question? Yes? Thank you, Prof. Uh, in the previous uh, framework, I s can notice that uh, exposure was different from vulnerability. But with this framework, I see density for me means uh, exposure. And it's part of vulnerability. How can you explain this? Well, all of these definitions are on the IPCC glossary. But I would say, for instance, uh, people living in, uh, let's say, uh, in Brazil, living in slopes. They build the houses in slopes. They remove the vegetation. They are exposed to the risk of a landslide because of rainfall and there is no vegetation. Vulnerability will be more like if you want to quantify this exposure, because there are vulnerability indices. You see, so one way to look at that is that vulnerability is something you quantify, 
the exposure is what happened, but you want to translate exposure in some index. And there are ways to calculate vulnerability indices. But these vulnerability indices, at least from the experience in Brazil, they involve climate variables and also non-climatic variables. Among them, the uh, density, population, uh, gross domestic product, uh, I mean, several things that has to do with, with uh, politics and socioeconomics. Okay? But I recommend you to, risk, to read the uh, IPCC glossary because all of these definitions are there. And I know it's kind of confusing because the vulnerability was a term that has been long, long time used by the social science community. So when meteorology and climate started to use vulnerability, the social science people were really very upset <laughs> because they thought that we were taking from them. And the idea of vulnerability means social science people working with physical science people, as the interaction of these three boxes show. Okay? Global change is a consequence of climate change. And we are dealing with the risk, actually, of the global change, not just the climate change. Any other? Yes, you in the back. Um, my question is regarding um, adaptive capacity or to adaptation to climate change. Uh, the presumption with which we start is that adapt adaptation has not been happening and it will it is going to happen as climate change happens in future. But do you think that adaptation is something which is part of human behavior and has been happening for ages, um, for, for a long, long time? And in some sense, it is just an extension that is going to happen in future. Maybe with respect to certain uh, changes, it is going to... Uh, be some additional behavioral changes are going to be in place, but part of it is already there. What is, I would like to know what is your view on that. Well, actually, adaptation is something not new. Without knowing, perhaps, some of the old, like uh, Incas, for instance, they start building the agriculture in what we call andenes, which are uh, platforms on the slopes. That's adaptation, because of the rain comes from one to another, and we don't have erosion in there. So perhaps we didn't call adaptation at the time, but it was one way to focus. So I can say that adaptation is something that has, has, has happened in the past. But the socioeconomic part of the equation has been changing a lot. So those changes that in the past we could explain better with adaptation now it seems to be different. Okay? So adaptation has happened in the past. Sometimes it's happening in the present. We don't know. Like in the semi-arid region in northeast Brazil, for instance, it's so semi-arid because we have six months of rain and six months of drought. So there is there are huge tanks. Every, one, every house has a tank, water tank in there, when they keep the rainfall from the rainy season and they survive the dry season with that rain. But when it doesn't rain, these tanks are empty. <laughs> you see? So the adaptation they have, it doesn't work. You have to see another way of adaptation. Our Brazilian company for agricultural development, which is Embrapa, it has been developing varieties of beans, for instance, corn, which are resist higher temperatures or dry conditions. This is adaptation. It takes time, it's expensive, but at the end, the money you are investing in adaptation will give you a huge return, but it takes time. Okay? I think he was asking in the back, yes. I have actually two concerns. One of the points is, you know, you were raising that governance is the most important thing. Sorry, I can hear. It means there was too much noise on the... You were, con you were raising governance as... Okay. You were raising governance as one of the most important thing. Yes. For countries in Africa, like mine in Ethiopia, we are ignoring the issue of governance and we are focusing on, you know, Mitigation, for example, you know, from the university where I'm from, we are working like, you know, the Ethiopian panel on climate change, like the Brazilian version, is working on. Okay. Uh, sorry, can you use Hello. the other microphone? Hello. I couldn't hear me. It's just some noise. Yeah. <coughs> we have the Ethiopian panel on climate change. 
the other version of the Brazilian panel on climate change, which is working more on mitigation than adaptation. For the small farm holders from the place where I'm from, they should have been working on adaptation than mitigation. Like uh, there is a project to articulate it in, which is sponsored by the World Bank. You know, carbon trading. For me, I don't see the contribution of that carbon trading than, you know, enhancing the resilience capacities to adaptation than working on mitigation. So I want to have you comment on why should we focus on mitigation while we should focus on adaptation, one of the concerns that I want to have you comment on that. The other thing is, you know, in the IPCC, competition of vulnerability, adaptive, adaptive capacity part of it, while yeah. we're putting adaptive capacity out of the vulnerability in this part. So I want to have your comment. Thank you. Yeah, they put it separate because the, let's say first you have the impacts from a weather extreme, whatever. We have the vulnerable people affected and we want to see the adaptive capacity of these people. So I, we just separate to make it easier, the analysis. But in fact, those two should be nearby, should be closer, because vulnerability and adaptation, they work together, you see. We just put it in separate because to make easy the analysis. But as you mentioned, for instance, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago at the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, and their focus on climate change. Interesting. But what was the focus on climate change? What building cities more resilient? Well, resilient to what? What kind of resilience are we talking about? Are we talking about resilience in terms of uh, weather extremes? Are we talking about resilience in terms of good materials for building houses so we can take advantage with solar panels and we can have our vertical gardens? It was unclear, you see, and some countries prefer to fund. For instance, in, in Brazil, we have a funding agency for the research on climate change and other projects for the adaptation based on the first one and other projects on mitigation based on the other two. So it depends on the focus of the agencies in there. At least in Brazil, we have the luck that we have a federal funding agency as Sao Paulo was the richest funding agency, actually. So we start working with some of them, separate, and then work together through what we call thematic projects. I think that uh, Professor, yesterday Professor Neutral was talking about the thematic projects. Thematic projects are the, all three teams together, you see. I mean, they are agencies just working in mitigation. Because of what? Mitigation, clean development mechanisms, this, let's say, these uh, projects that you can get and you get some funding for research. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work, but it hasn't worked that much. In Brazil, we have the first project on clean development mechanism. It uses methane from, from uh, garbage. You know, like these huge, uh, what's it called? Landfills. Landfills. People were using that oil gas, uh, methane gas coming from the garbage for cooking, for instance. Okay? This is mitigation. This is a good example of how uh, mitigation can help. But we can also talk mitigations in terms of large scale processes, like uh, filters on the chimneys from the uh, industry, for instance, to reduce. So it depends. The funding agencies have their own focus. But as you mentioned, adaptation should be perhaps the top one, because the adaptation is the one who favors people immediately. Mitigation is a long term. We want to reduce the warming to a two degrees. That's decades. But adaptation could be good enough to save people for the next rainy season, for instance. For me, adaptation is, in-person adaptation are the most important. Vulnerability assessments are great. But if you want to adapt to something, you have to realize what we are supposed to adapt to. If you don't have vulnerability assessments, it's difficult to establish uh, adaptation. That's what IPCC calls impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation together. But the big circle will be the understanding of it, which that includes, for instance, the basic, the basic science of climate change. Okay? Any other question or comment? Yes. Uh, is, there, is there any model which studies the water, resor water sources and related it with the mining problem or 
water use? I'm not aware of that. I mean, most of the projections from climate change are basically on the quantity of water, not on the quality of water. But I know that in some countries, mining is, is a major problem. Okay, I, I really, I don't know that much. Maybe somebody with a country with mining activity, perhaps Peru and Bolivia can say something about that, but most of our projections on climate change are not for water quality, are basically water quantity. At least so far, the models has not been developed to include this kind of water quality coming, for instance, from agriculture or from uh, acid rain or from uh, mining. I mean, if somebody knows more about that, please share with us. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, oh, I think first you and then you. I will have our coffee break after that, so. Okay. Me, my concern is on the adaptation strategy because uh, when I was following your discussion, you were saying that the bad governance can be the the main constraint to uh, adaptation strategy implementation. For instance, in my country, you have a good governance on that issue of adaptation strategy. Yes. But one of the main a problem you are, you are facing now is the the socio-economic barrier problem because in some in some areas in my country the adaptation strategy is that the population who are facing that a uh, issue of climate change are not accepting the adapt adaptation strategy proposed by the agricultural research institute because mm -hmm. of some socio-economic barriers yes. for instance if i take the the muslim part for instance they are not. They are reluctant to, for instance, the the rearing of pigs, because in their religions they are not allowed to to rear pigs. But we have found that the the rearing of pig can help them to to alleviate or reduce the uh, the loss of because they are facing drought issues in that mm -hmm. uh, area. So the second issue is the lack of capacity because in most in most develop a, a, a developing country, we are not we are not having that a technical. We are lack we are in lack of technicities and all these aspects, so that we don't have the capacity to to react to the event like a developed countries. Yes. And my second concern is on the adaptation, mitigation, and coping a coping strategy a concept because. Right now, I'm confused because in some literatures, there's the the definition of adaptation and mitigation are time-based. But if you look at the coping strategy, too, also is based on the time time concern. But from your definition, I'm a little bit confused. If you can give more clarification of on that three concept: adaptation, mitigation, and coping strategy. And if, is, is that possible to distinguish between adaptation and mitigation, for instance? Because when you are telling people, for instance, to reduce their emission from our habit, because telling people to reduce the consumption of meat, for instance, and going for the consumption of insects can help to reduce the methane and all these anthropogen, anthropogenic gases. But is that mitigation or adaptation? Thank you. Well, according to IPCC, if you check the glossary, there is a, a definition of adaptation and sub-definitions of adaptation, okay? Autonomous adaptation and others. I mean, I, it's too much. I, mean, I don't think I can talk about that that much now, but you can check that. But adaptation is something that has to be worked together between the population and the decision makers. This is what we so-call co-production. Because let's say, as you said, for instance, OK, the best way for you to survive is eating pigs. But the religion believes doesn't allow to do that. So before the establishment of adaptation has to be a co-production between decision makers and population. You see, it has to work together. It's not something that. You design it on a piece of paper and a supercomputer and then give it to you. Do this. No, it's not that way. You should define 
together with the population. That's called co-production. Okay? This is governance. The governance has to go down to the population and start talking about this. And mitigation defined by the IPCC is more like in the reduction of greenhouse gases. But this mitigation concept perhaps is more applicable to the production of fossil fuel, like the big countries like US and China, the first and second, I'm not sure who is first and who is second now, producers of, of CO2 because of uh, uh, carbon and all. So the, the real adaptation goes more to them. Because if you said, for instance, OK, the population is small town, they say, well, you are not supposed to eat meat because the cows release methane, and methane is a greenhouse gas. That's a small contribution. Mitigation applies more to the big countries like the US, China, or many of the other, UK, for instance, that they are the most responsible for that, you see? Mitigation and adaptation, they work together, but they are different. With adaptation, you're trying to survive on changes in weather. To cope is basically to combat the climate change. How you combat the climate change with mitigation, you see? These terms have a lot in common, but they were defined differently. Okay? Uh, I suggest you to check the glossary of the IPCC. You can download from the IPCC website and you, you will read. But in terms of adaptation, there are several definitions of adaptation, including maladaptation. Maladaptation means things that don't work. That somebody gives to you, and like you say, for instance, you are not forced to eat pig because of religious belief. That doesn't work. It's an adaptation that doesn't work. It has been many, many examples around the world of adaptation that doesn't work, which is called maladaptation. Okay? I think that was because you were several questions in one. I, I'm not sure if I cover all of them, but uh, I did my best. Any other? I think there was someone here. You? Uh, what action should be more important? In Thanks. What action should be more important in countries with low carbon emissions like Latin American countries? Adaptation or mitigation? Well, it depends because of uh, even though the countries with less emissions will be affected equally because of uh, the greenhouse gases are released by, the, let's say, the other countries. But the circulation of the atmosphere brings these gases everywhere. So even though the small countries, they don't release that much, they will feel the impact because of other countries are increasing more greenhouse gases. In those cases, I would say that perhaps adaptation is the best option because there is not much you can do. I mean, you don't release, your country doesn't release that much of greenhouse gases, but again, it will be affected by your neighbor greenhouse gases emissions. So the best, perhaps, strategy is adaptation. Because the uh, mitigation is a long-term process. But adaptation is something you may want to improve, in, uh, let's say, develop in the next year or so. With a long-term, uh, short, uh, reducing emissions, this is decades for these uh, measures to, to, to function. But with adaptation, it's something that has to do faster. Okay, then quick. I wouldn't say faster. I would say soon, sooner. Okay. One last question before coffee. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I have a small uh, cousin that the other day came home crying because uh, their te teacher told them that there, were, uh, there was a, a, a hole in the sky that is going to kill us all if we do not, we do not do anything about it. Okay? No? You understand? No. I'm no. Sorry. My, my, my small cousin told us that he was afraid because the teacher told them that, that there is a, a hole in the sky that is going to kill us all if we do not uh, uh, do anything about it. I mean, the yeah. teacher are uh, saying that kind of stuff to, to children in the schools. Yeah. You know, and, and, and <laughs> I, I think that education is like a, a strong adaptive tool to deal with climatic change from that down to up. So the question if, is if you, uh, you uh, know uh, if there is any formal program to uh, translate all this information to primary schools 
It is really a major concern. Perhaps they were referring to the, green, uh, to the ozone hole, you know, the hole in the sky that all these UV rays came and killed everyone. I mean, in the school of my son, it was the same situation. Once my son told me when I was, he knows I'm working with climate change and things like that. And he says, uh, Dad, my teacher told me that this is God's will. You see, okay, God's will what? The global warming is God's will. It's fine, it's one way to, to look at that. But when I talk to them, what do you mean with God's will? You mean that uh, God created men, men created greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases are related to that? Or is that this is God's will, there is nothing we can do, the end of the world is coming soon? I think she didn't mean that. But like you said, I mean, there is so, many, so much misconception on the basis which is means that the environmental education is a major, major problem everywhere, in the low levels. The centers in Brazil and several other places have been producing these sort of leaflets and figures and animations that show, for instance, the greenhouse gases and things like that, but that's not enough. So that's not enough. So we have to create the next generation of scientists. But if we are coming with a problem with the very, very basic education that teachers don't understand exactly. the problem, we may have a big problem in the future. You see, as you mentioned, it's, it's mandatory, these kind of changes everywhere, everywhere. And I think the IPCC has a concern on that. IPCC is not a research center. It's a, basically a, 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 a program that gets together scientists to do the assessments on climate change, but not to do research. It's to assess the research that has been produced. But they are having an extension and education and training, capacity building. We need these kind of things. And this is a major problem. Unfortunately, in every country, if teachers don't get trained, they will start transmitting information to kids. And this, when they grow, they were thinking that climate change doesn't exist, that this is an invention of the rich countries to stop development of, of the poor countries. The press is full of that. Okay, but as you mentioned, it's a major problem. that has to be very, very concerned about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can stop now. <laughs>